Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. On today's episode of Ancestral Health Today, we have Pilar Egues. Pilar is an Ecuadorian cultural anthropologist. She's a writer and award-winning filmmaker. Over the past 20 years, she has lived, worked, and carried out research in community-based projects in and about Ecuador, Argentina, Brazil, Cuba, and Japan. She's a co-founder and director of Comidas Que Curan, Foods That Heal, an independent food education and media company dedicated to researching and promoting traditional food knowledge through ethnographic research and film. Her award-winning documentaries have been screened in three different languages across North America, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Through her research, public speaking, and films, she amplifies the voices of older men and women who are the bearers of traditional knowledge about food and medicine in Latin America. She has brought this work to communities in Ecuador through filmmaking and research education projects, as well as to U.S. college students in the United States through film screening and lectures. She's published She's a published author and speaks internationally on topics ranging from cultural history, food heritage, health, nutrition, and conflict transformation. Pilar, welcome to the show. And can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Isabel, and uh, everyone that makes this podcast, pos podcast possible for inviting me. Um, mm, well, I'm from Ecuador. I'm the from... Pepin. Quito, the capital, and so from the highlands. Um, I I grew up there and partially went to school there. And then I came to the U.S. to finish my bachelor's degree. And then I went back to Ecuador for a while to get my master's and also work um, for a while. And then I came back here to, um, to Illinois to do a Ph.D. in sociocultural anthropology. Um, and after that, I, I did a postdoc uh, for two years at U of I in community health. Um, and that's where, when I started my food anthropology research, uh, focusing on Ecuador. And I've been doing that for the past about 10 years. Um, I started this project called Comidas Que Curan, food, Foods That Heal, which is now... Um, like a production company, film production and research um, project um, that I've been uh, I've been working on for several years. Um, <clears throat> I I love to to study and research about food. Um, so I'm an anthropologist. So I work with communities. I, I go into different communities, especially in Ecuador. I've, I've been that's that, that's been my focus for for the past ten years. And I I work with uh, youth and older people, uh, especially older women who are the bearers of the traditional knowledge um, with respect to medicine and food. And I also teach, so I, I do educational programs for uh, the youth, the the children and youth in the communities. Um, so we've we've done a couple of participatory uh, and collaborative uh, films yeah. with uh, the the, the people in communities, as well as other uh, other documentaries that yeah that still have the the participatory component. But um, uh, I've, like we've um, last year was particularly good because we. We aired. I think it were there were two, uh, two new documentaries, and it was a great. It was a great year because of that. Yeah, amazing. That's that's mm -hmm. a lot to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, what drew you to study anthropology in the first place? So I was doing my 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 undergrad in economics. That was my major. Um, it was really boring. I, I mean, I was really good at it. I, I kind of like, like, I really like math and yeah, I was good at, you know, I, I did really well, yeah. Yeah. but it was really boring because they, they always talked about models yeah. that didn't yeah, align with my experience in Latin America and, and Ecuador, growing up in Ecuador. So the economic models that I was learning about, they didn't align and it, it was mostly based on speculations and like, um, 
based on the history also like of the US and I was pretty disappointed so I wanted I, I ended up taking um elective class that was an anthropology class with this um these anthropologists that were focusing on the Zapatista movement in Chiapas, Mexico. Um, and that's when I fell in love with anthropology because they, I mean, they really, they really look at issues from this holistic perspective where not only the political aspects matter, but also the cultural aspects, economic aspects and the political economy aspects with respect to the broader um, global economy and the broader global context. So it was, uh, and then, then the spiritual aspects and we talked about food and we talked about culture. So that's, yeah, that that's what made me, you know, engage with, with anthropology and shift my, my career. And then from there, what gave you the impetus right. to even dive deeper into food anthropology and make that uh, a big part of your focus. So yeah, I took a break. Uh, well, the, yeah, I, I was doing anthropology, but no, I, I looked more at the history. So after that, um, well, I was I was working with communities first in Ecuador, and then um, I looked at issues of um, women's health and sexuality for a while. And then um, I was looking at human history. So that was my dissertation uh, focus. Um, so after that, I was ready to do something more in the field. And my motivation to start with food studies or food anthropology was, um, it was very personal. It was my personal journey with, with food and with health. So I had been for the, for the whole time that I was doing my PhD, I, I, I really struggled with my health. Um, looking back, I, I realized it was, it had a lot to do with stress, um, that yeah, I, it, it couldn't be fixed with, with the diet, but I kept looking in the diets like for answers and Done. I did, yeah, a bunch of diets, including vegan and, um, what's this other one, uh, the com compare comparable to vegan that you just eat rice and vegetables. Um, so I, I got really I became, yeah, I, st I lost a lot of weight. I was, I was really um, skinny that whole time. And I was always cold <laughs> and, um, and my gut was, I mean, that's when I, I really like destroyed my gut, um, uh. just eating. I mean, I was eating a lot of oatmeal. I ate it every day. Like I ate oatmeal every day. I, I didn't soak it or anything. I was just eating oatmeal because I felt that that was, you know, I was, it was healthy. And then, you know, the more vegetables and raw vegetables, um, I didn't understand. And a lot of beans also. Uh -huh. like, um, and then I, then I, you know, I kept talk, I kept in touch with a friend from Ecuador and she, she, you know, we exchanged a lot of this kind of information, and uh, and one day she gave me the Sally Fallon's book, Nourishing Traditions, uh -huh. and then I found what my mom's um, recipe for quin quinoa soup, which is a very, it's a it's a very traditional soup. It's a r traditional recipe from from Ecuador, especially from the highlands where I am from. So I was what? surprised to find that in that book and you know i read the book and i was surprised to find all of this like this new perspective on um that was for me like new because i had been looking in veganism or veg vegetarianism for answers and then all of a sudden like you know this book had a lot of good arguments for eating the traditional way the the way that my mom uh raised me with and my my, my grandmother raised me with and it was really simple for me to just try it. And as soon as I, I tried, um, I started eating meat and cause I, I was also, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't eat like red, like uh, beef or, and um, pork for a long time. So I started, you know, introducing more, more meat and eating more the traditional way, like, you know, 
chicken and rice and vegetables, <laughs> tortillas with cheese or whatever. And it's more close to my heart. And then immediately I started feeling better. So going back to your question, um, that's that's what made me um, a, that made me interested in in pursuing a um, food anthropology as a as a research path um, because. I realized how much wealth uh, of knowledge was in my own family. And, you know, that's what I found on this book. Um, and, and I was surprised that it was a, a book written in English and it was a best-selling book. And I wasn't looking at this for my own for my own health. And I felt that, and that other people also needed to know um, because everything made sense at, the, at that moment for me. Like... Everything made sense. Like um, this, this knowledge is being tested for so many generations, and it's been passed on, yeah. um, you know, by my my grandmother's ancestors, and and then I have that knowledge as well. Not not only for for like for food and for recipes, but also for medicinal um, medicinal recipes with herbs and mm-hmm. and other things that that are part of the way we are raised in Latin America. Uh, even my generation, I grew in the city, I grew up in the city, but but I got all of this knowledge from my 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 elders who were raised in the country. That they, they were they were closer to to the herbs, to the garden, to to the animals. And so they they have all of this folk knowledge uh, about food and medicine. So that's 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 what made me start this project. Wonderful. So tell me more about how you grew up and what was the food and culture intersection? How did people how did people relate to food? Who prepared those foods? Um, when was that um when different foods were utilized within your culture and how that impacted people's relationships and celebrations and so forth and so on and then what was the difference when you came to the states yeah there were there were a lot of questions there but one of the questions was like who prepared the food so for mm-hmm. us it was my mom like we we were raised uh, my brother and I were raised uh, by my mom uh, because my parents got divorced when I was 5 um, so I was raised by my mom, and she's the one that made the the food. And I remember, uh, was she? You know, I remember that she sometimes gave gave us soup or beans and rice. Um, not not so much meat. I don't remember meat, but yeah, beans and rice for breakfast or or soup for breakfast, which is very different to what what my peers in school. Um, were having because I went to a um, <clears throat> private school and my my friends in school or my not my friends but my 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 my, co- my, my classmates um, they were like wealthier and it was um, it was an American school so um, there's this cultural hegemony I don't know if um, if that makes sense, or I can unpack it, but basically, it's this idea that you have to you have to try to mimic um, the U.S. and U.S. culture and um, whatever is related to the United States and whatever is on like mm, Hollywood or you know the 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 magazines um, from the states. So my classmates were. I mean, I I know because I went to. Sometimes I stayed overnight, um, like sleepover at their home after doing um, like an assignment, and I know what they were they were having for breakfast, like um, cornflakes, cornflakes and milk and uh, and uh, orange juice and like pancakes, you know, pancakes from the box and. Because this, I mean, this these were very wealthy, um, you know, my wealthy families. The kids from wealthy families uh, were my my classmates, and so they these are the this is the class of of people that used to go to Miami like on the weekends, right? So they 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 have like they're being big land 
landowners, they, you know, they're, they're in the, in the political, also they, they also have a lot of political control in the country for a long time. They're part of the oligarchy, you would say. So they have, they have money. So they, they go to, to Miami and sometimes they bring stuff from there because at that time it was not so easy to get this kind of stuff, like in the supermarkets. Right now you can get like, uh, pancake syrup in the supermarket in some supermarkets but back then you you have to sometimes some of these things like very cultural cultural u.s cultural foods uh bring them directly from from the u.s so it was pretty sad but i mean i was bullied you know like in school for eating these um these foods that my mom made because we we were not we were not of this social class like my mom was working class she she was a nurse and she was a single mom, so um, she um, she sometimes sent me uh, also these traditional snacks, like uh-huh. in in my lunch box, and and I like it was yeah it was totally unacceptable <laughs> within my circle because it would be like toasted corn we we call it tostado, um, with uh, with chochos which is lupin uh, it, which is like um. It's a kind of bean that that grows in the Andean region that is very high in protein, and and these are also these are very um, these are traditional foods like even ancestral foods in this region. Like for example, lupin is is native is native to the Andes. Um, so uh, my classmates were bringing like you know packaged stuff, and that was a cool thing to do. And um, yeah, so that's what I remember in terms of my growing up. I also remember my mom going, uh, you know, doing a lot of effort to to bring me homemade food to wherever I was. So after after school, like high school or school, I, I went to music school in the afternoon. So I took the bus and dropped me off uh, at the music school and I spent my afternoon there. And then my mom would bring me the prepared food for me to eat like on the sideway uh, or on the sidewalk or like um, just the entrance of the music school, like, you know, hall. And I would be eating that. And it was kind of shameful at the time for me, like, you know, be eating that way because she didn't want me to eat the foods from the from the store, like, you know, the packaged foods. She would really take care of, of, of us. Um, in that way, like through the food that she would give us. And what I said about the breakfast is, is something very traditional in the country. You know, it's, it's very, it's a very much of a part of the rural culture to have this quote unquote heavy breakfast. What Uh you, for for us, for anyone today, like having soup for breakfast or like meat and beans and rice for breakfast is considered heavy. But in the country, it's traditional. It's traditional. Um, so that's yeah. That that's one of, one of the ways I think my mom showed us her love uh, by really you know putting so much effort in in really thinking in our nutrition, even though we didn't like it because it was not aligned with you know with what everybody else was doing and what our you know with classmates were doing, but. Um, yeah, uh, and then in terms of uh, the rituals and, and stuff that you were talking about, we we always got together with my family, especially my mom's side family, and my grandmother was like the matriarch. Yeah, <laughs> she she was the uh, the mom of five uh, sisters, like uh, that that were the sisters of my mom, my aunts, um, and they were many, especially a few or two or three of them were were like my moms my second moms also like they raised me they know a lot they knew a lot about like traditional foods and how to cook how to cook I really like mm-hmm. this knowledge of cooking traditional foods as well as medicine so they taught me a lot of the of the of the things I know about the herbs um even though it's not a lot but when I see other people, like other people don't know anything, but I know <laughs> that I realize <laughs> when I come here how much I know about herbs because my aunts taught me that. Like they, they, you know, they would they would um, prescribe uh, certain herbs and 
preparations and remedies um, in special circumstances. And, and I learned all of those things uh, growing up with them. So when we got together, it was all of, all of them cooking and the, the kitchen was a mess. <laughs> And um, my grandmother was usually very uh, stressed out. She was super stressed out because these traditional dishes are very complicated to make. Some of them, they are very, uh, in Spanish, my, my grandmother would, would say laborioso, which means it takes a lot of labor, like a lot of work. It's very complicated, cumbersome to do. Um, so she would have like an entire crew of people, like all of her, her daughters, uh, like helping out, and and then it, it would be a delicious meal. I mean, like I I can tell you about some of the recipes I that are very dear to me that you know my grandmother used to make, like um, the plantain ball soup. That's one of my favorites. Um, rompope. She made. She used to make. And she used to make these um, they're kind of like bum, buns, but um, they're made with this um, tuber, which is, again, I think only found in the Andes. I think in, in Ecuador and Colombia, they we call it zanahoria blanca, which would translate as white carrot, but it's not the white carrot that you or the parsnip that you find in the store here. It's a different kind of tuber. It's very... It's a it's a mix between yuca and um, something else, but it, it's one of my favorite foods. And she used to make it, just even boil that with some salt and and olive oil was like a and and she would she would tell me every like all of the health benefits that is good for fertility that is good for um, it, it's like a very light food that you can eat at night so it can help you sleep. Things like that. I mean, she knew everything about every food. So. That's amazing. So you go back and forth to um, your hometown, or yeah, especially recent. I mean, I've I've never uh, I've always stayed in touch, um, especially over the past, like I said, ten years, because I've been doing the research there. Um, so I go like every year, um, a, at least one time. But this past couple of years, I've been. I've been going back um, several times a year because I've been working on films so and research. Have you seen those traditions changed or have they stayed the same for the most part? Totally, yeah. I mean, I would say like it's it's not a new change, but it's it's changing more and more. Like, for example, over the past, I don't know, five to ten years that I've been going back, uh, what I've seen is that surprised me a lot is like um, I go there with a lot of expectation to eat good food um, because foods that you cannot find here in the States. And I, ha I like I go and ask, you know, friends or uh, acquaintances like, oh, can you recommend a place to eat? Like, a good And they would they a lot of them would say, just go to the mall and go to the mall to the food court. So everything, like I said, you know, there's this cultural imperialism that we are trying to mimic, you know, the United States and, uh, in every way. So the, the malls uh, look like a lot of them look like the malls here in the States. And they have a food court with a lot of these chains, a lot of which are U.S. Uh, food chains. And but a lot of them are also like local food, uh, national chains uh, also. So, for example, if you want ceviche or you want like arroz con menestra or something like very, very traditional, very like Ecuadorian, quote unquote, it's, it's very difficult to talk about Ecuadorian food because it's so diverse. There's so much of the regional cuisines. Um, but for example, yeah, there, there's some chains that you can find at the malls uh, where you can find ceviche and other things. And for me, the experience is, is terrible because I, one of the things for me most important for me is like to be able to eat in um, a real like with real silverware and in real plates and at these malls it's always at the um, it's always a you know the paper plates and the plastic silverware and for me that completely changes the experience of eating and the taste everything like 
uh, and because they're mass, they're they're chains. It's not it's not it's not the same. I, I was looking, you know, whenever I go, I always try to look for the hole in the wall type of places. Um, but there's also a lot of new new cuisine, like the 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 chefs that are like academic chefs. They've gone to school. And they're trying to use the traditional foods as a base and then create new recipes, um, which, you know, some of them are really good. Others are a ripoff, <laughs> in my perspective. And they also, I, I think they, they also, um, I, I'm very critical of the way a lot of the chefs um, or, or, or the chefs uh, inferiorize the the traditional foods and they claim to be doing something better i think the traditional it, foods and the traditional recipes can't be improved they are always yeah. already perfect um you can innovate you can create something different and that's fine but you cannot claim that it's better and a lot of these um, chefs, I mean, that's what they taught in, in schools, in the schools, in the, in the culinary schools, because they, they follow the European models, uh, the French cuisine and the Italian cuisine. Um, and I think that's a very Eurocentric way of looking at, at food and, and culture. And it's unfortunate because we have such a rich culture, uh, food culture, and we don't we don't need to okay. try to mimic anything or anybody i mean that's a very colonial kind of approach to food so yeah and how do you think that those changes are affecting the health of the population what have you observed well it's been going um uh, it's been following the trend in, in the developing world in the, in the in the us and europe like our epidemiological profile uh, of the population is no increased prevalence of chronic conditions like diabetes, heart disease, etc. But it's coexisting with um, infectious um, type like profile um, yeah. uh, and malnutrition. Malnutrition is 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 widespread. It's widespread, especially in the rural areas. So it's a combined kind of um, scenario um definitely the you know the the standardization of the diet is you know is is what is behind a lot of these um outcomes in terms of health um there used to be a lot more diversity in the diet in terms of the ingredients um uh. and that's where my my work with the seed savers come in because you know they there's a there's a there's a, a movement uh, of farmers in in Ecuador to try to save the seeds of many of these um, roast. vegetables roast. and fruits roast. and even animals <laughs> that used to be eaten and they're 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 getting forgotten or they're they're not grown mm. anymore yeah. um, and because it, it's it's well, becoming you... more and more standardized like just a few vegetables and no, you know there's just standard. In spite of that, if you go to a color to a supermarket, yeah. you will find a lot more diversity than you find in the U.S., uh, especially in, in some yeah. somewhere like the Midwest, for example, where I have lived for a long time. It's pretty pathetic. Like, you yeah. know, just apples and bananas uh, that come from somewhere else, like nothing's local. Over there, yes. Um, but not just that standardization, but, um, you know, the... It's it's all grown in um you know as monocrops and there's widespread use of pesticides and and it's obviously affecting people's health um, because of that and then I mean as um, cities have grown more and more uh, for example if I go back to to my home city Quito I don't recognize eighty uh, percent of the city. You would drop me there. I don't. I don't know where I am because only a tiny bit of it it remains from from the time where I grew up. So it's been growing so rapidly. People. I mean, there's a, a lot of immigration, and um, 
the city has grown so much that that it's just impossible to for me to uh, to recognize it. So what I, what I'm trying to get at is that. Um, all of these changes <clears throat> bring along lifestyle lifestyle cha changes for people, right? So there's like so much contamination, of so much traffic in the streets because population is growing and growing, and um, and all of these entails changes in how people eat. So it's really hard for people to go back to their. I mean, it's a, it's a city lifestyle. You you don't go back to your house to eat your food it's hard you know it's it, even you know people don't have time to make foods at home and the foods that they find in the in the street there's some good options um but um, a lot of it is fast food a lot of it is is con like convenience is winning um and that's impacting a lot of what people are experiences in ter experiencing in terms of health i think yeah the <laughs> industrialization and the you know fast foods know. and uh everybody's yeah. out to work and these traditional roles within families that mm -hmm. don't really exist anymore really change the landscape and it affects food culture it affects health it affects community um it, yeah. it's a ripple effect into everything yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because just yesterday I was talking to a, um, a friend of mine who is from, from, from my home city, and she was complaining about something I have also experienced that when I go back to, to Ecuador, I I noticed that a lot of people don't get together any uh, as often as uh, they used before. And getting to, I mean, like, I, I mean, I, I like to emphasize it. It's not just the food that you eat, but how you eat it. That yes. makes a difference in you know in in how you're gonna take that in how the impact is going to have in your body, etc. So um, these opportunities to eat uh, with your loved ones, to eat with, in community, I mean, this is how we evolved to eat. We evolved to eat um, with other people, right? To share our food with other people. That's that's it's kind of like in our brain, right? Um, at least, and and it's it's very it used to be a, I think it's it's much more still you know it's still a tradition or a, a way of of eating, that that is more prevalent in in Latin America and in Ecuador in general compared to the U.S. Like in the U.S., it's more common for people to be okay eating by themselves, um, but in Ecuador, no. In Ecuador, is is very is very much of a, a communal, a social uh, activity. So, uh, especially after the pandemic, this was, I mean, it, this really, it really changed the way that people interact with each other and with people, with cities growing, like I said, for example, I, I have family members that live in a part of the city that is very, like kind of far from, from the, like in a valley compared to the, you know, the main city and, um, they just don't like to go. They don't go because it's the traffic and, you know, it's the distance and they have a lot of these valleys that the, the surrounding cities and the <laughs> suburbs have grown so much that they have all their facilities like the banks and, you know, other things in that area and they don't have to go to the other area for any reason. So that's an excuse not to reunite with their, with their friends. So my friend was complaining that, you know, she has a group of friends and they never get together. They live in the same city. And every time we go back, like as an immigrants, right? Like we are always looking to meet with our loved ones, like with our friends. But we find out that they never get together <laughs> if we don't go back and, you know, create an excuse. So I think that this tendency to like alienate yourself from others um, is like ongoing, an ongoing one, but it has been strengthened after the pandemic, and it has hurt. I mean, it it definitely hurts your physical health, your mental health, and I still think that there there's a lot more research to be done in terms of what the impact of is of um, you know these psychosocial factors in in your health. Through, through food, 
Right. So not just what you eat, but in the context in which what you eat. I think some of those studies exist here in the U.S. in terms of obesity, for example, a child obesity. Um, they look at how like family meals um, make a difference compared to like eating fr in front of the TV or eating by yourself. <clears throat> so I think it's a big deal, you know, creating creating more opportunities to eat in community. And that not only entails like, you know, people getting together, but how spaces are organized. And like I said, that the more, you know, the more we try to mimic the U.S., the more uh, we are going to resemble these infrastructures and these structures that promote or facilitate you just grabbing something and eating it by yourself wherever you are or wherever wherever you go um, instead of creating this you know this um, this infrastructure I, I remember I think there's a chef's table uh, episode with this Italian chef that refused uh, to to put separate tables in his uh. his area it's amazing. It's a. It's. A, I, I thought it was. You know, it was revolutionary because he said this is the point. I mean, it really doesn't matter what you're eating. It matters that you. You are all. The, if you're coming to my restaurant, you have to all sit in this one table with two benches on the side, so that we can have a a communication around the food because that's that's what's making a difference. Yeah, it's important for sure. So tell me more about the work that you're doing about food. Um, let's start with Comidas Que Curan, Foods That Heal. Yeah, like I said, it was a project that was um, inspired in my in my desire to learn more and communicate to the world and to especially to my community about the value there is in the in our heritage, in our cultural heritage, and that is alive in the memory of. Uh, grandmothers and mothers and uh, and even in us you know uh, so that and that we need to really document it we need to promote it we, we need to know about it and and we need to raise awareness of the value it has and the urgency of um, of holding on to it um, because I think it's one of the treasures we have in our culture and in our country. Um, and I know this because I, I've been living in the U.S. for more than 15 years now. And I see that that kind of generational communication of knowledge, that um, transmission, is being interrupted for a long time here. Uh. Um, because the industry has taken the place of the, of the moms and the grandmothers. So the industry is the one who tells you what to eat because of through advertisements or whatever is available in the store. But, but it's not those heritage recipes, the one or, the, or, or your mom. I mean, but your mom might be cooking something uh, that is significant for the family and that's great. But it's, I mean, it's long disconnected from the local traditions. Um, and from the local foods, right? Um, so that's something that we still have in Ecuador. The, we still have a regional cuisine. That means that it's uh, a cuisine uh, whose value comes from the, the fact that it's cooked with, with local ingredients, with the, with the vegetables, with the fruits, and with the animals that are raised in the local area, in, in that area, and that have been you know, for generations, from thousands, for thousands of years. For example, one of my documentaries um, looks at a fishing community. They have been fishing. Their ancestors, I mean, as far as we know, were there like 5,000 years before Christ. They were fishing um, and they were diving and they were collecting their own food. Um. And the people there today continue to do the same. So... I mean, this is really powerful. If you look at yourself uh, or the you know ground where you're standing, how much of the food that you eat comes from the local, the local traditions, the local, uh, y y the local vegetables, the local fruit. Maybe one percent. Maybe for for some people, maybe nothing. Maybe everything yeah. that they they eat comes from somewhere else. 
they don't even know where it comes from. I mean, it may come from as far as China, you know? So there's such a disconnect uh, from this, from the land, you know, from the land where you're standing, which is a really powerful um, um, way to build a sense of belonging. And belonging is a very, very powerful uh, factor in mental health and physical health. I mean, it's it's one of the things that keep uh, keep us going. You need to have this sense of belonging, this belonging, this community, and and food is is one way in which in which you reinforce that belonging. It's really important for mental health. The fact that your your food is a meaningful, it means something. It it has a tradition. It has a story um, that is shared and that has been passed along for for so many years for the for this in this community that you're part of. So um, this is what this is what drove me to do this this work and um, put it in the film format. So put it in a video format because younger generations, uh, like kids and you know teenagers, they're not too interested in listening to their grandmothers. <laughs> it's not interesting to them. Um, so that, that was one of the ways that I and my, my colleague Alejandra came up with in terms of how to entice, how to, um, motivate, especially younger generations by creating this space, not only to engage, um, with this knowledge in an audiovisual format, um, like in our digital age, but also to create, um, learning uh, learning opportunities for them to also participate in the making and be the protagonists uh, so be the ones that are in the big screen both as you know as youth and to see their elders as protagonists in this in these films um, is very empowering it's very empowering for for everybody in the community and I just heard from from some friends in in Esmeraldas, where I uh, where I did one of my like two of my films are based in Esmeraldas, which is um, an area in the coast um, with a w- with an, a very strong tradition Afro Afro Ecuadorian tradition. Uh, majority of the population is um, of African descent, and the, and the food is such an important part. But again, they have all of these influences from the city and from you know, from abroad, from the U.S., um, and they brought the film <laughs> to my two two of these films, uh, two of my films, to the communities, and they just told me about like, how excited the, the kids were to see themselves in the in the in the film and to see their family members in the film, because um, it's a big deal. <laughs> it's a yeah. big deal, especially especially if they know it's been screened somewhere else. It's received uh, recognitions like awards. Um, I hope one day we will be on the TV. You know, we, we will we will get these films to show on on the mainstream media because it's it's such a powerful influence uh, yeah. for for people, right? So that's you know that's that's kind of like the the philosophy behind the, this project. There's a lot of us in the U.S. that have come yeah. from other places, <laughs> other countries. How do you think we can best balance mm-hmm. maintaining those traditions alive and telling those stories to our children um, and and keeping that knowledge going without having access to the land where those foods mm-hmm. come from? One of the things that I struggle with, I love my Dominican food, but uh, you know that food is traveling a lot of miles. Yeah. Um, is is one thing, and you know that um, that struggle between eating that and putting more emphasis on what's local to the area so where I am in the Northeast, which is nothing like what I grew up with or like the most. So, how do you keep that balance um, yeah. going? I love that question. Yeah, because it, I struggle with the same, but I think you can do both things because. Uh, I don't, I'm not like, um, 
I don't advocate for like a fanatic kind of like, you know, close-minded uh, approach to to eating and food. I think I think food is really, it's, it's meaning. It's the meaning you make uh, or you put in, in the food or the meaning that the food has for you. Um, um, like I said, and it connects a lot with your emotions, with your memory, with your sense of belonging, with your connection to other people who you are eating with. So if we like like us, we are immigrants, right? Uh, we we are com we are sharing with other people that might or might not be our family members or our members of our ethnic community, um, and we are still building a community. We're still building a bond through the food, whatever food it is. Mm -hmm. um, we are still building a bond, a, a community, and we are still nourishing ourselves by sharing that food with other people no matter what it is. Again, I, I am all for agroecology and, you know, organic foods and everything, but but this is not the only way of looking at health. I mean, if we look at health from an integral, from a holistic perspective, like I said at the beginning, um, it's much more than that. It's much more than what you put in your plate. So for me, you can do that. You can still do that. The first thing I did here was try to find like what are the farms that are nearby. There are so many farms and they have local produce. They, they have milk, they have cheese, they have stuff. And for me, it's always a discovery. You know, I I, I, disco I, I just discovered a skier. Love it. I, I, didn't, I yeah. didn't know about <laughs> it until I, I came here. And it's amazing. Like yeah. they make it with the maple syrup that they make here. And for me, that's part of life, you know, that's part of health. That's is being able to feel pleasure from experimenting new things and new flavors and new sensations. And I mean, traditional is great, but we are human beings. We are we are we are made to to try new things and experiment and we get we, we get pleasure from that. And pleasure is good for us. You know, it's good for it, it's healing, it's it's repairing ourselves. Um, but but on the other hand, I also think that uh, we have a right to we have a right to um, to our nostalgic foods. Yeah, so I think uh, I mean it, it's very powerful. I, I have a friend who studies um, this concept of nostalgia, food nostalgia, and it's something that develops. Um, early in our years, like as we are developing our brain, uh, you know, our brain develops in our early years. And this is when these memories of the first foods um, stick to our brain and, and stay with us for the rest of our life. So, and and again, they, they are tied to memories uh, and, uh, and a sense of security that came with that, with that space, and that was our home. And for immigrants, I mean, we we navigate these these feelings and these emotions in, in various ways, but it's still part of who we are. And I think we have a right to it because it's, I mean, it's so it, it never goes away. And it again, it's a source of pleasure. It's a source of peace of mind, of comfort that we get from uh, from you know, reproducing, replicating, trying to replicate, attempting to replicate. Sometimes it's impossible to replicate, but these attempts to replicate our nostalgic foods, our, our traditional foods from home, um, are also have a healing benefit for us, like a, a healing potential, because they are uh, they are having this effect of you know generating pleasure and 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 you know, having this whole effect in our body. So I hear you about, you know, the carbon footprint with, you know, bananas or plantains traveling, like, I don't know how many kilometers um, to reach this grocery store. But, um, but I think, I think we, we are not to, first of all, I, I advocate for a guilt-free food and, and guilt-free eating in in that sense, not in the sense that we get in the in the in the tags uh, from the food industry, like oh, it doesn't have sugar, that's why you you are you you don't have to feel guilty. No, 
we we shouldn't feel guilty at all <laughs> from eating any food because if you add the guilt to the food, you're harming yourself. You're eating something toxic. Really? I mean, you're having a talk like you're you're really hurting yourself by by just adding guilt to food. And there's that's again like a big uh, a big question mark for for research. I think uh, the psychology food psychologists are are doing a lot a little bit of research on on the impacts of you know what is the state um our emotional state when we eat and a lot of us are eating with guilt and a, a lot of us are eating with fear <laughs> and stress fear and frazzled and stress and, and stress so we really that's something that this is this is a diet that we need to follow like you know a guilt free um eating experience in the sense that wherever whatever comes to your plate um in a given opportunity uh, you know to you nourish need to, you you yeah. need to you need to get out of that place of guilt and of fear and whatever is is preventing you from enjoying that moment as it is with the people that you have around because a lot of these diets uh, they put a lot of restrictions and they 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 keep us away, you know, they, they, they take us away, they distance us from these opportunities to share food with other people. And I think that's really, I mean, it's, it's, it's harming, it's very harmful because we are losing a, a huge opportunity to build a bond with someone because we are making a food choice. And yeah, I think that's, that's, um, that's pointless. And in terms of, of like feeling guilty for the footprint, I don't think we are the ones uh, called, I, I don't think we, we, because we are, we are eating our plantain or whatever, like our traditional food, we are not, a, <laughs> we are not responsible uh, for a, a huge amount of that, you know, that damage, whatever it is uh, for the, for the, uh, I think there's, there's bigger forces, there's bigger forces compared to the ones that address the needs of immigrants <laughs> or that demand um, that there is in the markets for, for these nostalgic foods. And and us, I mean, it's it's part of the world we live in. I think we go back and forth more and more often um, as you know, transportation becomes more available. I mean, and it's just part of the world we live in. I think we 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 can't we we can't turn away from that at this point because immigration is something that is a, something like a continuum, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, it's it. And in terms of, like you were saying, like preserving the traditions or feeding into those, I think um, borrowing a little bit from the local and, you know, appreciating and teaching our, you know, younger generations to appreciate what's local, <laughs> but at, at the same time to feel pride and love for your heritage. Because a lot of, um, like I, I was saying at the beginning, um, a lot of us experience shame around uh our heritage, our cultural heritage, when it comes to food, and it should be the case. You know, we we shouldn't be feeling uh, ashamed for what we are eating because it's it, there's nothing to be ashamed. I mean, it's a yeah. big uh, it's a big value that we bring to the to our community, to ourselves, and to the world. Yeah, so beautifully said. And that ancestral way of eating is just it's not just what's on your plate, but how you're experiencing. Um, the food and mm -hmm. how it's nourishing who you are sharing it with and yeah. going back to those traditions of food bringing us together um and being at the center no matter what it is yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um so if someone is listening to this and you know they may be the typical person lives alone works many hours eats on the go and they want to learn more about this way of uh, experiencing food, where would you advise them to start? Well, well I would, I mean, I always tell people to watch my films. <laughs> I mean, and so a lot of, a little bit of this is, is registered there in, in, in some of my films. I've also written, written a, about this in a few papers and they're, and they're in English, so um, 
there on my website, mm -hmm. um, comidasquecuran.org. Maybe you can include it in your... Yes, we'll put it on the, the show notes. notes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And yeah, I've, I mean, invite me to teach a class. <laughs> I've, I've, in my, I've, I've taught workshops and, and classes where I do a lot of these ex exercises like this. Um, I have people have different experiences with eating, like eating alone, eating with someone else, and eating with an enemy, eating with a friend. <laughs> um, it's, um, it's part of my interest in conflict transformation. I use some of these exercises with, with eating um, in different contexts to understand some of the, some of the ways in which can we can communicate across conflict. So, um, yeah, I, I've, um, I love to teach um, these classes. There's, there's not an online class right now, but I'm always accepting proposals to, to teach and bring, you know, these, these ideas to, to communities, whether it's spiritually or in person. And I think that's, that's what I can say for now. Wonderful. So comidasquecuran.com.org. Mm -hmm. no, dot dot and we'll link that in the show notes. Any other places that people can find you, social media that you'd like to share? Yeah. Uh, uh, Instagram is Comidas Que Curan. And um, I'm on Twitter as Pilar Ewes, even though I'm not very active on Twitter. But more more Instagram and Facebook. My Instagram, um, and also uh, in Instagram, I have a um, Raspando underscore Coco, which is my one, my first film. Um I try to post um, in English and in Spanish, but you, I mean, you can still use the translator to, yes. to, f to find out what, I, what I'm talking about. I, I, you know, I've, I've conveyed a lot about this in my, in the papers I've written and in, you know, some of my talks are, are also listed on the website. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. And also um, our Ancestral Health Symposium uh, YouTube channel. Some of your talks are also in there. Yeah. So people I have can one. go and see one. those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us today, Pilar. This has been an amazing conversation. And um, I'm sure that people will enjoy it and give some more thought about the place that food has in their lives and um, how it can be a transformative experience. Awesome. Thank you, Isabel. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.